This unit deals with social psychology, the fact that we live in a social environment and we are affected by other people and our behavior can affect other people. Now, last, in the last unit, we talked about personality, this idea that people behave differently because they have different traits. In fact, the situations they're in is sort of irrelevant. It's their personality that produces the behaviors that you're seeing. And we can attribute different people with different personalities. Some are extroverts, some are introvert, and so forth. Now, a psychologist named Walter Michel criticized personality psychology because he believed that situations that people are in really controls behavior. They have a greater effect on behavior than personality traits. So people can be very outgoing in some situations, like in front of a classroom, but they can be very introverted in other situations, like in a social event. So Walter Michel's critique of personality was that the social environment is absolutely critical in determining what behavior you're going to see in a person, not just their enduring traits. So social psychology is really how is behavior influenced by other people and how is behavior influenced by being in different kinds of social environments. We're going to talk about social cognition. We're going to talk about attitudes. And then we're going to talk about conformity, compliance, and obedience, the fact that people, other people can control our behavior in a social environment. Now, social cognition are these thought processes that are involved in interpreting our behavior and the behavior of others. Sometimes this is called attribution theory. How do we attribute the behavior that we're observing? And Heider was the father of attribution theory. Now, when we look at somebody's behavior, the idea is that it can be really produced by two different factors. It can be produced by those enduring traits, and those are called dispositional attributions, that disposition is producing the behavior, and it be caused be caused by the situation, called a situational attribution. So both the personality, the individual traits, and the environment the person is in can really control behavior. So social cognition is the com combination of these two factors. Both are important, not just one. Now, there's something called the fundamental attribution error, which you will see when you're making attributions about the behavior of others, or others are making attributions about our behavior. Then the attribution error is that we overestimate dispositional attributions in others, and we overestimate situational attributions about ourselves. So when we look at the behavior of others, we tend to attribute those to their disposition, their traits, their personality, but our own behavior, we believe, is controlled by situation. This overestimation of these two factors is what produces the fundamental attribution error. So if I'm in the food court at the student center, and somebody handles, ha hands the person in front of me a plate of hot food, and they drop it, and I say, what a klutz. God. But if they hand me a plate of food, and I drop it, I will say things like, well, the plate was hot. Well, it was slippery. It's something about the environment that controls the behavior. But in others, it's just their personality. Now, here's a study. We talked about this, actually, we talked about personality, but by Nesbitt and his associates, University of Michigan, where he showed that if we, we, we give uh, words and we give situations like take yourself or take your best friend or take your father or take Walter Cronkite, and when this study was done, was a big television announcer on the news, and say, do they primarily have a trait term that can account for their behavior, or does it depend upon the situation? Notice that with ourselves, we make a fundamental attribution error. We say the situation is more important than we say for the other people, people other people that we are rating their behavior. There, we tend to overestimate the trait word, and for us, we overestimate the situation. Fundamental attribution error. Now, one of the things about social cognition that's very important is Festinger's cognitive distance theory. That often we, we have tension in, in our beliefs, in our, what's happening in a situation, 
and that we act very strongly to reduce that tension, that dissonance that's produced by those two, two factors. So cognitive dissonance is that feeling of discomfort that we have by simultaneously holding two or more conflicting ideas, beliefs, emotional reactions, or values. We want to do what we can to reduce that tension, to reduce that dissonance. So he actually believed that we were driven to do that. That was a very important factor controlling our behavior. Whatever we have to do so we can reduce that tension and reduce that dissonance. So we have cognitive dissonance. We act in ways that will reduce that dissonance. And so we can produce a homeostasis-like product, that is, cognitive consistency. So our goal is to have cognitive consistency, not having these tensions between our thoughts. Now, Festinger and Carl Smith did a very classic study in cognitive dissonance, where they had participants do two very boring tasks, a half hour of turning a little knobs on a board one quarter away, over and over, very repetitive task, and then having to remove things out of a basket and put them back in. Very competitive, boring, boring task for a half hour each. And then he said, oh, uh, my assistant isn't here yet, and I have somebody waiting out there to be in this experiment that you just were in. Uh, I'll give you, and it was either $1 or $20, to lie about how really enjoyable the task is. I want them to think it's an enjoyable task. Would you do that? And so the subject agrees to go out for $1 for $20, $20 a nice payment, $1, not very much, to go out and really to lie about the fact that this task that they did for an hour was enjoyable. And what he found, if, it, if they weren't told anything, just a control group, not given anything, just to go out, that when they later came back in and had to rate the task, they rated it as somewhat boring even though they had just asked somebody to uh, say that the task was enjoyable, I mean, lied to somebody about how enjoyable the task was. If they gave them a $20 bill, it also, they would rate it sort of as a little bit boring. But if they gave them just $1, you won't predict this, they actually rated the task as somewhat enjoyable. Now, they believed this was because of cognitive dissonance. They had this boring task, and here they were lying to someone about how enjoyable it was. And that's going to produce a, still a negative rating of the, of the task uh, that is boring. If you, if you gave them $20, boy, well, I'm lying, but yeah, but I was well paid to do it. That's why I did it. So cognitive dissonance is reduced, and you're still rated as boring. But if you only give them $1, you still have that dissonance. I'm lying about this task as being enjoyable when in fact it was boring. So either something has to change. So what you do is you say, well, the task wasn't that bad. It's, you know, it was, it, it, it was enjoyable. And so you actually rate the task as enjoyable. In other words, the only way you can reduce the dissonance is not by saying, well, at least I was paid well to do it, is by changing your feelings about the task. Then you can reduce that distance and reach somewhat cognitive consistency. Now, a study that was done by Aronson and Carl Smith actually did it in children. Cognitive distance in young children found exactly the same thing. They had a room full of toys, and they went to, took the child in, and they said, you can play with any of the toys in the room, but don't play with this toy, which was the big toy, like a, a big steam shovel that you could move around and really fancy toy. You cannot play with that one. If you play with that one, then... I will give you a mild sort of reprimand, or I'll give you severe punishment. So they had two consequences of playing with the toy. They didn't play with the toy. And then later they would come back in the room and they'd say, okay, now you can play with any toys you want. Doesn't matter. Have fun. And the interesting thing is threats of mild punishment produce less toy play with the preferred toy than threats of severe punishment. Again, it's the same thing. If you, if you had severe punishment, now you have cognitive dissonance and you can play with the toy, but if it was mild punishment, you're not reducing the cognitive dissonance for playing. You just don't play with it. It's not, it's not worth it to play with the toy. So Festinger believed that you have cognitive dissonance. You're driven to reduce that distance in any way you can by changing your views or changing the situation. 
And then if you do that, if you reduce the cognitive distance, you have cognitive consistency. Thank you.